Hi everyone, it's Bennett Phillips with Sales for Startups, and I'm here with Tom Gonser from DocuSign, the global standard in digital transaction management. Hi Tom, how are you today? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. Thanks for doing this. Absolutely. Had a few questions for you, just hoping to learn from your experience of you know, taking DocuSign from a startup to where it is now. Um, so my first question is, you, you, doc, you uh, founded DocuSign in 2003. Yep. And since then you've watched it grow and evolve for almost 12 years. It's been an amazing ride. So what do you think would be the one thing that, about the company today that would surprise 2003 Tom the most? Well, I think if you look at when we started, what we were trying to do um, was actually just get signatures to be electronic. And that's kind of what we thought the problem was. It turned out that that was close, <laughs> but the platform is so much bigger today than we would have imagined in you know, 10 years ago. Um, you know, the, it turns out that the problem isn't that um, you need an electronic signature. The problem is we have this workflow that we're doing that we didn't automate because we needed a signature. So the platform actually evolved from just doing a signature to actually managing the entire workflow. So that's what we call it digital transaction management. But that was not something I set out to at the beginning. I didn't have any idea how big the platform would be. Mm -hmm. So when you founded the company, how did you know you were ready to really start a business? Well, this is the third company I've started. So okay. <laughs> yeah. I didn't really know how to do anything else. Yeah. Interesting, when I started the company, um, I actually started two companies at the same time. Um, I was actually also looking if there's something else I could engage with, but I was just familiar with if you have a good idea, you know, you know what someone should do. I just say it all the time. And um, so I actually started a GPS technology company and DocuSign at the same time. And for a while, the GPS company was actually doing much better. Interesting. <laughs> so then what shifted your focus to DocuSign? It's a much bigger market. I mean, the, the focus for the GPS technology company was really on a very narrow niche. Um, G, T, GPS telemetry tracking devices sold into the military. So the market's not that big for that technology, and it's evolved past um, where we were. So when you first embarked upon the journey of, of DocuSign, and I guess in particular knowing that you wanted to go in that direction versus the other company you were doing, what fears did you have initially, and how did you overcome them? Well, I mean, I think you have the standard fears. Once you've started a few companies, and especially started companies that didn't make it, and you run out of money, <laughs> that's obviously a fear. Sure. Um, you know, I have a family, two kids, um, mortgage payment, your fear is that you're just going to burn all that down again. Of course. Um, and I think when we started DocuSign, one of the big fears was, you know, we're changing behavior. This is, which is something you're always told not to do when you start a company. It's too hard to change behavior. Um, try to follow behavior, try to enhance behavior, but we're changing the way people have been doing business for 4,000 years. So hmm. we, it took us three years before we actually even tried to sell the service because we were really honing in on how do you make something that actually works legally mm -hmm. um, but is easy to use and people would believe they're actually signing a contract. Right. So, so then if, if you sort of knew this was the direction, it seemed there was a need, um, yet people were so used to doing something another way, right? So how did you know that that was the place to approach the market knowing that People don't do it this way. They may not yep. want to do it this way, but yet there is a need. Seems to be a little bit of conflict. I thought it was inevitable. I thought um, the last company I started was doing transaction management for mortgage transactions. Mm -hmm. So all the data and documents that went with a mortgage origination. Um, and, but we weren't doing anything with signing. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty obvious that you're going to have to solve the signature problem somehow. And once we sort of initially built the product and had the, the first prototypes working, it became obvious that this was inevitable. This is going to be the way the world evolves. Right. So we may as well be the one to do it. Um, and there were a lot of people who said, you can't do it. And my first legal review, um, they came back with big binders and basically said, this is never going to work. There's no way you're going to get people to sign documents. I mean, there's different rules in different states. Mm -hmm. um, but we just believed it was inevitable, so we just kept going. So you mentioned that you didn't even try to sell the product for the first four years? Four years? Three. Three years. So then, once you did get to that stage, what did the early sales process look like? And how has it evolved? Over yeah, <laughs> it's very evolved. Sure. Um, 
you know, we've got what 500 salespeople now, yeah. and so what, it's what a machine. Look like? you know, well, it, it pretty messy. Yeah, pretty messy, um, and probably more messy with DocuSign than some other products might be, mm -hmm. because again, this is a new product in a new category that no one really done before. Mm -hmm. And so, when you're putting a sales sales group together the first time, you're kind of saying, well, you're the first salesperson has ever sold this product. Here's your quota. <laughs> what should it be? You know, how much right. can someone sell? So you, you don't really know to begin with. So you end up sort of feeling your way around. Uh, but I would say the initial sales efforts were just, I mean, they weren't that good. They were not professional. Um, didn't result in very much sales. Um, and it really took us a few laps before we actually got somebody in who was a professional sales manager. Mm -hmm. And that changed everything. Um, all of a sudden, you know, we were in, we were in work at six o'clock in the morning because we wanted to do business on the East Coast. We, we just added a lot more rigor to the sales process, right. and that started to click. Um, and then once you start the once this machine starts, then you can sort of tune it from there. But we we spent a year without really having the sales machine be started. I'm sure you're constantly tuning it, even still. Oh, absolutely. No, and we've we have uh, enterprise sales and corporate sales sort of different. Corporate sales is mostly on the phone. Um, and it's a machine, um, very, very well-tuned machine with onboarding processes, training processes, um, different types of sales going after different phases in the sales cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we've, we've really got it down. So when you were getting over that initial hump, right, of just getting sales to just sort of work, were there any things that stood out as kind of bright spots, you know, moments where uh, training you did or a process you installed or anything like that that said, all right, we're really doing this in a professional way now. Yeah, I, I really think, you know, I'd give credit to the, the first few folks who were actually professional salespeople. I mean, initially we were selling. Sure, of course. So I'm not a professional salesperson. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you got to do it. You're you got to do it. Right? Yeah. And, and we were making it happen. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't on a program. It wasn't, didn't have the rigor you need in a real sales program. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we got the first few folks in who really had that DNA, all of a sudden, we had a pipeline. You know, we had call reports. We had the things you need to make a sales organization actually happen. So it came from the talent you brought in. Absolutely. So with that, any any best practices you would say for say an early stage startup on attracting and retaining the best talent when it comes to sales? Yeah, I'm clearly. So my next company that I start, <laughs> you always learn. Yeah. Um, if it's not part of the founding team, it'll be somebody very early on right. um, who has that DNA. Um, getting a sales process in place early, I think, is really important. Whatever it is, I don't care what, what the process is, it depends on your business, but you have to have some process in hand. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, um, do you think there was a specific turning point when you knew that DocuSign was going to be a success? In the early days, is there a sort of a... Yeah, I mean, I think... <laughs> I, I, there's sort of two answers to that. One is, yeah, there was there was a couple points, and they, they were when DocuSign stories started to happen outside of DocuSign. Uh -huh. um, was Meaning in the press or driving down the freeway, listening to the radio in L.A., uh -huh. and I heard a radio ad from a, an insurance company, and they were bragging about how they could use DocuSign and get your insurance done in, in like five minutes. And that wasn't a paid spot. We had nothing to do with it. Yeah, it was yeah. pretty amazing. So you've seen some of those stories happen. Um, when you start to see, again, back to the sales team, when you start to see the sales team be able to forecast and hit their number, mm -hmm. um, and it seems like it's always the same, right? It's towards the end of the quarter, uh, I'm not sure, it's going to be a stretch, and then somehow they eke it out to right. 110%. Um, but when you see that machine start to kick in and, and quarter after quarter be able to do that, it really starts to feel like you have an engine. How big do you think the sales team was when you felt we've got that engine? <laughs> uh, probably, I think, you know, it took a while for us to actually forecast and hit numbers. Uh, it was probably 10, 15 people. Okay, yeah. All in. So you're in charge of strategy for DocuSign. Yep. And given how much the technology's landscape, uh, landscape has changed over the past decade or so, you know, a lot of new companies emerging, buyer behavior is changing too and just new techno technology coming out. How has the strategy evolved to really kind of you know, keep up? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we are, and I think any successful company, are a little bit paranoid. Mm -hmm. So we're always looking at new technology that comes out. Is it friend or foe? Mm -hmm. um, if it's something that um, we should be adopting as part of our platform or 
it's some change we need to make, we want to be the ones that disrupt our company, not somebody else. Right. So we're constantly looking at new entrants to the marketplace, new technologies. I mean, the whole mobile thing was fantastic for us. We, we invested early, um, and it had a huge impact on our business. So we're constantly looking at what's happening. Um, and, you know, whether it's you know, new, the, the, the market as it evolves, we will disrupt ourselves before somebody else does. Yeah, I like that. I like that phrasing a lot. So you mentioned kind of watching the technology out there and connecting with, with you know, technologies if they make sense for you. And um, I noticed that you guys have entered into partnerships with like PayPal, Salesforce, Google, and even Equifax to do some sort of in-app signature stuff. So, um, you know, for any technology startup founder or early employee leader who's trying to forge some of these relationships with great channel partners or other technologies that just make sense to kind of work together. Any advice you'd have as far as forging those relationships, kind of, you know, negotiating those agreements, that kind of thing? Well, I mean, I think it takes a long time. I think, uh, sales is something you can, you know, what's the number going to be this quarter? Yeah. A new partnership, there isn't going to be a number this quarter. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's going to take some time to get the partnership in place, especially big deals. Um, you know, our Salesforce partnership is very strong and generating a great deal of revenue now. The first year it was just all building um, and it was bumpy. So it takes, especially when you're a small company, it takes a while to get something cranked up and running. Um, and I think you just have to, you have to, you have to prepare yourself for the fact that it's going to take some time. It's also incredibly important. Um, the reason we actually got our first round of professional investing is because of the fact that we had a partnership with the largest forms provider in the real estate industry. It became the way that they saw, oh, this is how DocuSign gets big fast. And it didn't get big fast. <laughs> it did on some scale, but it was a lot faster than we'd try to do that hand-to-hand -hand combat. I right. uh, never would have been able to get the market going. Um, and the other thing I think is important is y y you go through a phase, uh, especially if you have somebody who's coming in to build your channel program, your partner program, mm -hmm. where you can make a mistake to go get as many partners as you can. Right. That's not a very good idea because you end up diluting all of the efforts on the ones that matter if you're trying to get 50 partners. So you might target the ones that you really think make a difference in your, in your market, mm -hmm. but you might not be able to get all of them right. or the ones you want. So there's going to be some others that you can, you can go nail down. You'll, you'll tell with, the, with the, the traction, but it's better to get a good solid you know, middle-sized partner going mm -hmm. than waste all your energy on some big A player that never actually happens. So that's an interesting conundrum, right? Because you don't want to spread yourself too thin, yet you don't want to put all of your you know, eggs in one basket either. Yep. Right? yep. So just finding that balance. And I think we probably spread ourselves too thin as we were growing the business. Um, we ended up with partners that didn't generate much. Um, but we, we ended up actually, by, by virtue of the fact we just focused on the ones that were moving, um, they, be, they became good partners. Yeah. But we probably, wasted a lot of energy on partnerships that didn't. Sure, sure. So what advice would you have for a startup founder or a founder, founding team on creating or revising their go-to-market strategy? Yeah, I mean, I think the key point there is data, right? As okay. much as possible, make decisions based on data, mm -hmm. um, especially as the business starts to grow, where you actually have data. Um, in the very early days, you might not have it. It's like, this is my hunch. Right. <laughs> I think we should sell into this vertical yeah. um, because they have the biggest paper problem. Uh, but as you get bigger and you build your product, your platform, especially if you do what we do, where you've got a SaaS platform that, I mean, we can dashboard this whole thing. We can tell exactly what's happening, what's working, what's not. Um, and so then you make decisions that are actually based on some data instead of just your hunch. Um, it's kind of amazing what kind of insights you can get if you really actually look. So that's interesting, right? I mean, I think there's that, there's the, the gut feeling side, right? It's like that emotional side of business decision making. And then it's the data. So when you're real early on, what did you experience in terms of just knowing what to trust? You know, do I trust my gut or do I trust... You trust know, your gut. The data or and you move, data. you move quickly, actually. So if you're going the wrong direction, you find out fast uh -huh. and then adjust. And you're small, you can do that. You have to do that. Right. So trust your gut, but if, if it starts to feel wrong... Keep your eyes open. Away, yeah. Don't, don't hang yourself, plan, exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Got it, okay, great. So off topic from sales and strategy a little bit, but in terms of this sort of emotional side gut feeling, you know, what do you feel like uh, is, 
you know, what's most important in terms of like emotional and mental toughness, <laughs> you know, as an entrepreneur, right? It's just business. I mean, so what, don't take yourself too seriously. No, that, that clearly you? not. I mean, can you, say, can you say a little bit more? I th I think you can't define yourself by your job, right? I mean, the minute you become your job, mm -hmm. then something goes wrong. You start feeling horrible about it. It's you need to keep yourself separate from what you're doing. Um, and, it's, and I say job, I don't mean job. I've never, I haven't had a job for 25 years. Um, I joke actually, you know, I, I would say that I have not worked for 25 years because if you'd asked me any time in the last 25 years, if I wasn't working, I would be doing this. Right. <laughs> this is actually really interesting. So this is life. This is life. Um, but this isn't, the, I'm not defining myself by this. I love windsurfing, I love hiking, um, mountain biking. There's a lot of stuff I really like to do. I can get very distracted. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important to keep those two things separate, uh -huh. even when you're working your ass off, because yeah. um, you have to keep those separate. And the other thing I think is, you know, it, it, um, it, it, there are things that will happen that will be, you'll, you'll find yourself in, in situations, and I can remember lots of them, where I have no idea how we're going to get out of this, right. how we're going to solve this problem. That kind of thing, right? We're raising money at Christmas time, and it's like, uh -huh. these are really tough things. Sure. But if I remind myself now, those are amazing times mm -hmm. because you do solve them. You do you know, get out of them and you, you actually do um, prevail. And when you look back at it, at least I do, it's like those are the most fun times I can remember because you solved something really tough. Yeah, you um, in the moment, it might be terrifying, but right. that's, you know, that's why this is fun. <laughs> so it's kind of, so what I'm hearing from you is, you know, don't take it too seriously, right? This is life if something doesn't work out. Yep. You know, you're not dead. Yep. And the other being kind of have fun with it. I think so. And I also think that um, when you start a company and it fails and you lose all your money, mm -hmm. the world doesn't end. Start another one. Start another one. There's a, it's kind of amazing because I think a lot of people hold back. They, they, they don't go for it because they, what would, have, what would happen if that happened? Right. Actually, nothing happens. It sucks for a while, but Here the world are. doesn't end. The sun yeah. still comes up. It's kind of amazing that once you realize that, you actually let yourself make much stronger decisions. You actually can start a company, right? As soon as you're not afraid of that. So any other advice or suggestions you'd have to an early stage startup founder, sales leader? I think, I mean, the only thing that separates people who make successful companies happen and people who wish they did is just taking that step. Just kind of amazing. I, I didn't for years. The step being, just do it? Just do it. I mean, literally, I mean, my father thought I was crazy. You quit a perfectly good job at a you know, big company, and how are you going to make money? <laughs> hey, we're going to do this. I'm like, well, what if, what if, what if, what if? Yeah. Oh, we're going to solve that problem. I like to say nothing succeeds like persistence. I think that's a great note to end on. Thank <laughs> All you, right. Tom. You bet. Really appreciate it. You bet.